With that said, I would like to introduce our final speaker for the day, um, which is Dr. Rudolph McCreel. Uh, I actually have the privilege of doing this. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Professor McCreel is the Charles Howard Chandler Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Emory University. He is the author of Diltai, Philosopher of the Human Studies, or Philosopher of the Human Studies, yes. Uh, imagination and Interpretation in Kant, Orientation and Judgment in Hermeneutics. He co-edited and co-translated selected works of Wilhelm Diltai and was the editor of the Journal of the History of Philosophy from 1983 to 1998. McCreel's work has concentrated on hermeneutics and aesthetics by developing ideas from the German philosophers Wilhelm Diltai and Immanuel Kant. He is focused on the roles of the imaginative judgment and interpretation within Kant's critical system. Implication of Kant's conception of reflective judgment for hermeneutics and for the theory of the human sciences are also central to McCreel's writings. A new book, Kant's Worldview, How Judgment Shapes Human Comprehension, will appear within Northwestern University Press later this year. And I'll just end with, uh, I think as for many of us, um, uh, Professor McCreel's works have been critical to our own understandings and workings with Kant and certainly especially critical for us in philosophy of culture about how we understand Kant's role in thinking about and engaging with philosophy of culture. So I'm very excited to uh, be able to introduce him today. And with that, I give it over to him. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and for inviting me in general. Uh, I'm, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, an important function of the arts is to reorient the way we attend to things and evaluate them. Starting with Plato and Aristotle, the classical imitation theory expects the arts to do so by raising our level of awareness. This can give the arts a kind of allegorical or otherworldly status. I will argue that since modern times, the emphasis has been more on how the arts can enhance the disworldly cultural significance of our life, starting with efforts to cultivate good taste. For Kant, this demands a new kind of self-orientation that expands our horizon beyond our local context. His ideas of imaginative schematization and the symbolic recontextualization inspired Susan Langer to regard the arts as virtual symbolic forms. Because he, she allows the arts to become decontextualized from the actual world, it will be counterbalanced with more current proposals, such as Art Hedanto's about the transfiguration of the commonplace and some of my own Diltai inspired ideas about artistic medial context that can reconfigure things to make us see the world itself differently. Kant says that beauty is not about formal perfection that could be conceptually defined, but about a felt form that enlivens our mental powers above all. This, does, does, this seems subjective, but it is not a narrow or arbitrary approach to the arts. Aesthetic feelings are not just private, but communicative in nature and make it possible to achieve an intersubjective consensus. <clears throat> Whereas most, yeah, now I don't know, I don't know how to move to the next screen. Uh, Click your arrow to the right, your right arrow key, and that should change it to the next slide. Like, like the uh, little triangle, not the uh, not your mouse, just the uh, arrow keys. Click on the main screen, and then the uh, the arrow key, the, the right pointed arrow key. Or the down the down arrow will do it too. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Does it work? No, no, uh, just just on your computer keyboard. Uh, so, uh, Rudy, just click on the screen 
where you are right now. Mm -hmm. So just so that the menu goes away. Okay, just click anywhere. Click anywhere. Oh, not not so hard. Just a little click. Okay. Well. Uh, Is the next screen coming? No. No. Uh, you've got to hit the down arrow, but it doesn't work unless you clear that That's little menu right. away. No. Well, I'll just to give up then. Um, <laughs> it's too bad. Uh, <laughs> Because I had some go to slides. Well, I'm oh, sure here. you did. Yeah, oh, there, 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 that'll do. That'll do. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas most judgments are conceptual and objectively determinant, an aesthetic judgment is subjectively orientational and brings our feelings into reflective play. Kant considers it a mode of reflective judgment that amounts to an evaluation that requires a comparative frame of reference. In section two of the introduction to the critique of the power of judgment, he delineates four such contextual frames, a possible field of thought, an actual territory of experience, a domain of necessary order and a contingent habitat. These ideational contexts exhibit divergent regions, ranges and judgmental concerns, but they can also intersect as when domains and habitats occupy different parts of one and the same territory. <clears throat> when it comes to orienting our judgment of taste, Kant admits in his lectures on logic that most of our felt responses to things are shaped by the habitat we happen to grow up in. In such a local context, taste is still an imitative mode of fashion or aesthetic prejudice. What is liberating about a proper judgment of taste is that it contextually expands our way of thinking into a wider territory. To cultivate good taste, is to do more than passively reflect the attitudes of those who surround me. I cannot judge a flower to be beautiful, according to Kant, but ascribing, without ascribing the pleasure that I feel to human beings more generally. It is a judgment of active social engagement with others that can imaginatively reorient me from a local context to a more worldly, cultural one. None. The felt affirmation that a flower is beautiful does not add to my cognition of it, but it is purposes, it is purposive for cognition in general. It is suggests not only that there is more objective order in the world than we know, but also that there are certain feelings that are communicable and can become intersubjective. For Kant, the reflective judgment that something is beautiful betokens that it is something more than what I happen to like, and that this assessment can in principle be made communicable, even if I do not have the concepts to communicate it in a way that is demonstrable to others. Aesthetic pleasure derived from beauty will expand my mode of thinking. This expansiveness is even more evident in the aesthetic pleasure derived from the sublime. And the sublime is aroused by an initially overwhelming experience. Kant points to, for example, to the shapeless mountain masses towering above one another in wild disorder. Initially, massive mountains and raging seas startle the mind because our imagination cannot fully survey them and is frustrated. <clears throat> According to Kant, it is only because we are cultured and possess reason that this initial pleasure at the wildness of displeasure at the wildness of nature can be turned into pleasure. 
the inability, so you can see these, these uh, screens? Yes, we can see them now, they're coming through. The inability to measure what is seen in the comparative terms that apply to our ordinary world shocks our reason into the realization that each of us has an infinite and incomparable potential. This reorienting pleasure of the sublime comes in the blink of an eye for an instant, augenblick, that is a limiting point of time. It provides not a determinate intuition of the world, an unshown der Welt, that requires a linear stretch of time, but an indeterminate worldview, Weltanschauung, that is discerned in a vanishing point of the timeline. Uh, instant grasp. Many scholars have claimed that Kant was the first to use the word Weltanschauung, but it is not a personal meditative worldview in the current sense, more an imaginary viewing of the world as an infinite expanse that exceeds mathematical measurement, just as a reflective meditative worldview orients us to what is known about the world by exceeding what the sciences can account for. So Kant's imaginary viewing of the phenomenal world inspired by the sublime reorients us to what he considers its numinal substrate. This deeper glimpse into the world hovers between the phenomenal and the noumenal and is about our ultimate destiny. Most readers of Kant think that the sublime represents the defeat of the imagination. <clears throat> but in a generally overlooked note, he observes that the convulsive nature of the sublime can expand the imagination. He says it acquires an enlargement and power which is greater than that which it sacrifices, but whose ground is hidden from it. But the imagination loses in intuitive power, perceptual power, it gains as a reflectively felt, recontextualizing interpretive power. The sublime can imaginatively reorient our relation to the world and extend the judgmental potential of the imagination. In the introduction to the critique of judgment, Kant writes that as a reflective power on its own, judgment can claim no field of object as its domain, yet it can have some territory. Domains are law bound context and too well defined and ordered to do justice to spontaneous aesthetic representations. Since Kant indicates that there is always something unexpected about something that strikes us as beautiful it is initially part of a limited and contingent habitat that we are then expected to relate to the larger territory of human experience. As you can hear, my voice is not very strong and I have um, a, a situation that's called dysphagia where the muscles of the throat are somewhat weak. And I'm getting therapy for that. So Randy has offered to some, sometimes read parts of the paper. And I, I, I appeal to him now, are you there? Uh, yeah. Yes, so I think he that, is. This is what's coming on. Unmute. Okay, let me unmute. And now let me get the paper back up. Uh, Page six. Yes, yes, I've got it. Okay, so um, beginning at the top of page six again, Kant claims, uh, so Rudy's going to have to excuse himself and uh, go uh, do what he needs to do with his swallowing, and he'll take over again when he can get back. So the paper continues. Kant claims that it would be self-contradictory. No, you, you skipped the, the quote. The, the oh, oh okay, yes. Yeah, so, so here comes here comes the quote. The predicate's beautiful. Is, uh, is a mere placeholder for a more considered assessment 
that needs to be made in conjunction with those who experience the world like us. It invokes a universal communicability without appealing to ready concepts. Indeed, Kant speaks of an aesthetic schematization without a concept that opens up a way of imaginatively or symbolically engaging with an object without fully determining it. What is characteristic about an aesthetic judgment, but X is beautiful, right, is that it does not strip the essence of something from its accidental aspects, but puts them into a contextual interplay that is individuating. Different contexts bring out additional aspects of things. Okay, now continuing. Kant claims that it would be self-contradictory to assign the communicability of the aesthetic pleasure immediately to, quote, the representation through which the object is given, end quote. Instead, the universal communicability of aesthetic beauty pertains to, quote, the state of mind in the given represent uh, representation, which, as the subjective condition of the judgment of taste, must serve as its ground and have the pleasure in the object as a consequence, end quote. And so this is on the slide, as immediately given to me, this is the next slide, but I don't know if Rudy's there to change it, as immediately given to me, the beautiful figures painted by Botticelli pleasurably affect the private habitat of the psychic, that is the Zelisha, level of my soul, but Aesthetically, these figures must be imaginatively schematized onto a larger cultural territory of what can be humanly shared, and the reflective pleasure that then pervades my mental state, gamut, follows from also considering myself as a part of this territory. Thus, we must expand the scope of culture from an ethnic habitat and that's Alphantal, uh, to a, a more worldly territory, which is Boden in Kant's sense. Whereas in the first critique, the imaginative schematization inherent in pure concepts of the understanding linked them to objects in the well-defined domain of the laws of nature in the third critique. Uh, so we've got, by contrast, in the third critique, quote, schematizing without a concept end quote, has no predefined boundary. Here, the imagination recontextualizes objects so that we can adopt a proper attitude toward them that allows our pleasure to be enhanced by being shared. So is Rudy back? I, uh, I'm, uh, I've got a paper right in the middle of my screen. He, you are. Rudy, are you ready to take over there? Because yep. I'm just- Take just, over yeah. again, yes. Okay, good, good. Mm. So being shared, Rudy. Going, going beyond the conceptual mode of schematization that prefigures the objects of the natural world, the aesthetic mode of schematization can reconfigure them into social context so that they can be evaluated intersubjectively. The idea of schematic reconfiguration brings out the worldly import of the thing of beauty. Aesthetic pleasure transforms a mere private sensation into a communal sentiment that comes to refers to as the census communis. We do this by comparing our judgments, not so much with the actual as rather with the merely possible judgments of others. This means that in approaching the actual territory of human experience, from the standpoint of our contingent habitat, we must also imagine this territory as surrounded by the field of the possible. <clears throat> In a proper judgment of taste, my relation to the represented object is mediated by the, by, by the way my cognitive faculties function in attunement with human beings in general. This territory we call culture is clearly an important aspect of this attunement. Insofar as the harmonious interplay of my imagination and understanding in appreciating the organization of work of art 
also evokes that state of mind minimally necessary for cognition as such. Kant <clears throat> holds that aesthetic pleasure is in principle universally communicable. And if my pleasure possesses this communicability, I will be judging the aesthetic object, not just through its effect on me, but through my attitude of engagement with others and their expected consent. <clears throat> In paragraph 59 of the Critique of Judgment, the discussion of imaginative schematization is expanded by means of the idea of hypotyposis, which also means making room for linguistic symbolization. Hypertyposis is the process of giving representational content to representational thought and can produce either a schematic mode of intuition, which is direct, or a medial mode of symbolization, which is indirect. Schematization remains direct if it stays within the bounds of what is experienced. Aesthetic symbolization, however, is indirect by configuring relations among various contexts that allow artists to make interpretive claims that go beyond their experience. Symbolization adds a presentational medial dimension to aesthetic schematization that allows artists to discern analogous relations among different contexts. <clears throat> a reflective rule about how the constituents of a familiar and intuitable context function together is extended to eliminate a phenomena of a more abstract nature may be related in a different, less familiar context. Thus, Kant symbolizes the political difference between despotic and constitutional governments by describing the former as machines that are controlled from without and the latter as organisms that are organized from within. There is no one-to-one -one intuitive correspondence between a political republic and an organic system, merely a reflective analogy that empowers the imagination. So there is this contextual relation here that, that Kant makes possible through his notion of schematization. I hear a voice here. I now turn to Langer's theory of art. In philosophy in a new key, Langer supplements linguistic modes of symbolization with what she calls presentational symbolism. Langer's, Langer's presentational symbols are pre-linguistic and are already at work in dreaming. Such symbols are as much about what we feel as about what we think. Whereas the discursive symbolism of language in mathematics is necessary to order and make sense of the actual world, <clears throat> presentational symbolism creates a virtual world that goes back to dreaming and mythical consciousness. Langer asserts that visual forms, lines, colors, proportions, are just as capable of articulation, that is of complex combinations as words are. But the laws that govern this sort of articulation are altogether different from the laws of syntax that govern language. What art teaches us, according to Langer, is the power of abstractive seeing, namely the formal capacity to see configurations as symbols of a virtual world that can be felt. 
the discursive symbols of language and the presentational symbols of the arts are both abstract, according to Langer, but their organizational order is different. <clears throat> this is obvious when considering spatial visual forms, which, quote, do not present their constituents successively, but simultaneously. But even the temporal forms of music and poetry evoke a sense of co-presence, according to Langer. This is because the artistic elements that compose a larger articulate symbol <clears throat> are understood only through the meaning of the whole, through their relations within the total structure. The elements, the elements of presentational symbols have no de denotative meaning. They are purely connotational and configurative. Whereas languages excel in denoting the order of the external world, the presentational symbols of the arts are better in articulating the order of our inner life. They create virtual contexts that have felt import. So here we have another kind of context. Randy, you want to read a little more to give my voice a rest? Yes, yes, I'm I'm with you. Um, let me pull up the paper because I had Please. to close it. Okay. Please In feeling, well. yeah, I've got it. In feeling and form, published eleven years later and eleven years after philosophy and a new key, Langer expands on the formal characteristics of artistic symbolism by also delineating the ideational thought content that individuates each of the arts. Each of the main three visual arts has its own mode of configuring space that gives it an ideational form that is decontextualized from the real world. The essential function of a painting is to transform experiential space as it extends outwards from all of the senses into a virtual space that exists for vision alone and is limited, quote, limited by a frame. Pictorial space is a, quote, deep space full of shapes, end quote, and colors that organize it to create the semblance of a virtual scene. Sculpture remains three-dimensional and may seem less illusionary, but here the challenge is to disclose more than the bulk of a figure by showing how it commands the space around it. Langer calls the semblance of sculpture kinetic volume. The third kind of visual art is architecture, uh, which creates another mode of virtual space. Although architecture has the function of housing human life, it does so in more than a protective sense. It creates a public structure that, quote, detaches itself from its actual setting and acquires a different context, end quote, that she calls, quote, an ethnic domain, end quote. This is one of the few times that Langer alludes to a cultural or a social space. And this is the next slide. Langer's next task is to show that although literature uh, uses discursive symbols as its material, the overall semblance created is a presentational symbol. One of her examples is the lyric poem, The Tiger by William Blake. Oh, the opening lines, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, signal that we are not dealing with an ordinary tiger and an actual forest, Blake, quote, assimilates the forests to the night instead of making darkness an attribute of the forests as common sense would do, end quote. We are immediately shifted into a virtual world. A lyric poem thus creates the semblance of something momentary, whether it be, quote, the occurrence of a living thought, the sweep of an emotion, or the intense experience of a mood, end quote. Other forms of literature make it evident that the sense of life that is presented in them is not merely organic and mental, but also historical. Literature, beginning with the epic, that, uh, beginning with the epic creates the illusion of a virtual history. 
the connections in a poetically created world, quote, operate as the motives for expectation, fulfillment, frustration, surprise, end quote. Drama stands out for creating the semblance of a history with a single rhythmic, stru rhythmic structure. When Langer comes to discuss the modern novel, her claims become more tentative as she moves from poetic to prose fiction. She complains that it is all too easy for critics of novels to treat them as a document of their age. The import of the novel must remain, quote, formulated feeling not sociological or psychological theory, end quote. It is characterized as a still evolving prose genre with many new, quote, representational features, end quote, whose presentational semblance is not yet definable. You let me know, Rudy, when you're ready to take over again. Yeah, Langer, okay, yeah. okay, Langer is more receptive to film Oh, well, that's one of my favorite parts of the book. It's a little tiny part at the end. Uh, Langer is more receptive to film. It remains a poetic art, she says, for like a dream, film, quote, enthralls and uh, uh, commingles all the senses, end quote, to produce a captivating illusion. In ordinary dreams, we are at the center. We are at the center of the situations that emerge. But in watching a film, we have for us the semblance of a dream without being at the center of it. Whereas the plasticity of sculpture was said to command the space of it, the space of dreams and films is characterized as, quote, as a, quote, space that comes and goes. Uh, it is always a secondary illusion, in quote. The semblance of the film creates a virtual presence that, quote, move forward and backward, In quote, the harshness of the real world gives way to an ethereal dream world in film. Okay, <clears throat> although Langer characterizations of the different arts are insightful, <clears throat> they leave out too much of the real world. <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is because she thought in the spirit of the new criticism of the mid 20th century, which excluded biographical and historical information from literary criticism. <clears throat> Her efforts to downplay the discursive symbolism that is obviously present in literature, as well as in vocal music, also led her to reject reflective interpretations of the arts. <clears throat> Arts are allowed to present a semblance of reflection, but not reflection itself. She grants that the words in the Bach cantata may have suggested tonal renderings by their emotive values, but what it all comes down to is that words with all their religious or human significance have been assimilated by a purely musical form, the matrix, <clears throat> Of the cantata. Similarly, she insists that programmatic elements in the symphony be conventionalized so they can be absorbed into the overall virtual semblance of felt duration. Too much emphasis on denotative themes can indeed detract from its overall musical effect on us. But if the role of the work of art as a presentational symbol is to transform everyday emotions and ordinary discursive thought into more formal ways of appreciating things, then why not also consider how they can prismatically focus real life and reflect back on it, since we can only experience the hypnotic influence of music or of a recited poem, as long as the performance lasts, why not also expand on it to awaken a new attitude that can illuminate reality at large? <clears throat> the significance of Langer's symbolic approach to the art derives from her clear delineation of the virtual spheres they can draw us into. This works especially well for the appreciation of the visual arts and instrumental music and lyric poetry, 
but not so well for operas and novels. How it relates to culture also remains unclear. <clears throat> the more encompassing hermeneutic approach of Diltai allows us to see the arts not only as forms that decontextualize the actual world into virtual counterparts, but also as offering recontextualizations of the world that can give new meaning to it. Thus for Diltai, the novel need not be considered a deficient mode of art because it still represents the world, as long as it does so in a representative way. The statics must make room to be sure for abstractic seeing as, as Langer proposes it, but the philosophy of art must also embrace the kind of typical seeing that novels make possible, according to Diltai. <clears throat> to fill the gap, oh, here's a new, to fill the gap that Langer created between presentational and linguistic symbols, I propose an intermediary typifying kind of symbolization. First, Langer's presentational symbols provide intuitive semblances and ordinary linguistic symbols are ideational representational. Delta's typicality is imaginatively representative play of words here. The imagination allows us to hover between the particularity of intuition and the universality of ideational thought and in so doing can generate individuating types. The imaginative typicality that Diltai expected to find in literature comes about when what the poet expresses based on specific lived experiences at the same time articulates something about the cultural context of life that we participate in. <clears throat> what is articulated is the style of a work of art, which we can now define as the distinctive medial quality that brings their form and content together. This confluence is made most evident when Diltai writes that composers do not translate their private feelings into musical tones because their feelings are geared to a shared tonal world from the very start. Whereas Langer has given us a glimpse into the timeless symbolic form of each genre of art. I think Diltai's concern with medial typicality and style exposed the historicity of artistic creativity. And here art is culture in the fullest sense. Randy, you want to read a little more? All right. The idea of virtual contexts is no longer unique to the arts. For today, our real world is pervaded by the virtual medial web of the internet. Whereas cyberspace has indiscriminately expanded the natural and cultural worlds, more recent recontextualizing approaches to the arts tend to, at least in <laughs> some way, narrow them in order to focus our attention more discriminately. We see this in Arthur Danto's attempts to make sense of the pop art of the 1960s. Thus, he claimed that Warhol's Brillo box can only be appreciated as a work of art if <laughs> one has, quote, mastered a good deal of artistic theory as well as a considerable amount of uh, the history of New York painting, in quote, in the mid 20th century. The recognition of it as art is said to depend on the viewer's capacity to recontextualize something from ordinary life into an institutional art world. Thus, the transfiguration of the commonplace provides a, a medial mm. context mm. that is neither quite nature nor culture, a settling uh, or a setting that allows for, but does not demand transfiguration. But the interpretive transfiguration of commonplace can also proceed less esoterically than Warhol and his supporting institutions do as part of a more accessible 
uh, artistic medial context like the tonal sphere that Diltai highlighted. The idea of a shareable medial context can provide the nexus for reorienting our meaning expectations without needing to resort to insider institutional validation or art theory, although the setting for that context could not be devoid of culture. This is the next slide. Traditionally, artistic content was conceived as having representational meaning, meaning content, that is then presented in a medium with material content. However, the confluence of meaning content and material content, embodied meaning in Dante's sense, can be considered as present from the start in the medial content, context that orient artists as well as their public. This is like the tonal world where we can hear uh, Beethoven intensify the rhythms of Haydn uh, and darken the lyricism of Mozart. Artistic medial context, contexts provide not just a material medium for embodiment, but also the means for the communication of meaning that can be technically, technically transmitted from one generation of artists to the next to further develop. The merging of communication and medial transmission has come to, the, to a head with the digital revolution. This is the new frontier of culture, and thus thinking about it is part of the philosophy of culture. You let me know, Rudy, when you're ready to take yes, over. Uh, now we'll take over. We're okay. getting to the end. <laughs> here's, the next, here's the next slide. Contemporary visual artists often confront us with objects that have been taken out of their formal, normal life context and call for media reorientation. <clears throat> This occurred most strikingly when Marcel Duchamp isolated the urinal from the normal context of its use to exhibit its pristine porcelain surface, apart from that context. That was a case of simple decontextualization. But with his bicycle wheel, the detached bicycle fork and wheel are mounted upside down on a wooden stool. Here, decontextualization produces a reorientation that creates a new medial context for the spectator in which the fragile elegance of the black wheel can be contrasted with the sturdiness of the white stool. However, medial recontextualization is not limited to commonplace utilitarian items. The cubists already deconstructed meaningful human figures Thus, in many Picasso portraits, a face that can still be recognized as part of a living body is simultaneously geometrically refigured. Another technique he and Brock popularized was to supplement paint with collage. Now, contemporary artists regularly produce hybrid medial context in which personal technique and impersonal technology are made to converge for artistic effect. They challenge our normal ways of seeing. <clears throat> All this comes together in the world of film. Langer spoke of it as a variant of the original mode of virtual presence, namely dreaming. But dreams merely recontextualize what we have already experienced and allow us to reconfront what remained unresolved. They provide a private illusionary context to refocus past situations, but this can become so claustrophobic that it is a relief to wake up in the real world. Films transport us to a public space. They create a wider medial context with enough time and space for both flashbacks and glimpses into the future. What may at first seem like an or arbitrary change of scene in a film can re in retrospect be recognized as providing the context for revising our understanding of other scenes. Films allow us to shift readily from one context to another in the manner of Kant, as well as to recognize how different contexts can be made to intersect at certain key moments as imagined by Diltai. 
So then there's an intersection of different contexts. But such overlapping can also exhibit meaningful tensions that resist full convergence. Here is the last paragraph for some conclusions. We saw that what is expressed by artists tends to also betray something about their circumstances and has contextual implications. We focused on Kant's claim that a proper judgment of taste requires us to expand our horizon and transpose ourselves from our contingent local habitat to the wider territory of the census communis. This made aesthetic judgment an exercise in reorienting ourselves. With the rise of historical consciousness, the arts acquired a more distinctive symbolic and cultural functions that can enrich your own self-understanding. However, to the extent that different social systems provide alternative value parameters for the arts, their meaning may remain equivocal. Langer evaded this problem by differentiating the arts into a series of virtual mini worlds that are decontextualized from the actual world. Today, the challenge is to recontextualize things medially to nudge us to question what we have done to this world and help us to remake it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have our uh, silent uh, claps here. Um, as before, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, I already see a few. Um, from, hold on, uh, from uh, uh, Peniel, go ahead. Thanks very much, Chief. Um, thank you, that was very interesting. I was just wondering if you could perhaps, I, I mean, through the course of what you were saying, between Lange, Dilthard, and, and Kant, um, it, it, it really made me think about what uh, in art as experience do we call an experience. So it, it, it seems to me that the point of, of that uh, concept of an experience is, 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 that, is a capacity to, 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 to enter a, a deeper context of experience. So in a way, he says, I, I think, correct me people if I'm wrong, but uh, he says that while, while science uh, represents the world, art expresses, it, expresses the, uh, an experience. And I was just wondering if this capacity of, you know, recontextualize things, placing ourselves in a sort of um, deeper space of experience between each other is, is, is similar to what you said about the symbols that Lange talks about, or that little type when, or can when he talks about the free play, but a free play that is public. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, what I try to do is, I think, is to show not only that art is expressive and that it expresses feelings, but it also draws at the same time that it expresses what comes from the artist in him or herself, but also draws on something that, uh, this, that the situation that Fresnick was talking about, that it, it, you know, we are always situated. And so that um, like the style of our work is not just the expression of what I feel, but also draws on something from the cultural context in which I live. And it's that, and it's that capacity to, to shift from the private context to the public, the larger, that is at play, I think, in artistic creativity. And that allows us to communicate, even without concepts. We, we kind of draw on that shared, felt uh, context, as it were. That that uh, that we are in a sense a part of, without necessarily being able to cons 
fully conceptualize it. So it's that interplay uh, of the imagination that's hovering between the, the Kant goes and the, the sublime, between the phenomenal and the noumenal, the, the earthly and the worldly. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a sense of filling in that in between that we can't kind of put our fingers on, but that somehow that brings us together. So it's a, it's an individual experience, but it's also something social. Uh, and, and it's this mysteriousness of, of, of these two aspects that, that I want to focus with orient, uh, with the notion of context. Uh, and in my book on orientation and judgment in hermeneutics, uh, I talk about one of the main tasks of hermeneutics is to, to make us aware of these different contexts in which we are, which we are part of, that situate us, and that often we miss we. We don't understand each other because a term is not properly defined by the context in which it's used. So that, you know, uh, we have to, we can't just talk in scientific terms, uh, you know, discursive symbolism, but there are also other kinds of terms. And so that, that's what I consider to be the main task of hermeneutics. But I draw on these art aesthetic experiences as I see Kant. So I mean, I see Kant's critique of judgment as an incredibly powerful work because it it uses the artist, but it, it's it's not just uh, it's it's a kind of a model for for uh, for hermeneutics. People haven't related. What he says, I mean, I don't think Kant fully related what he said uh, in the introduction about these different contexts, field, territory, domain. Each has a different modality. And if we're not careful, we, 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 you know, we don't understand or we become too scientific, uh, scientistic, if you will, but, and Kant's worldview, as I kind of work it out in this new book that's coming out in November, is, is an attempt to kind of pull these different kinds of uh, thinking. You know, I mean, uh, one of the terms that I never thought about before is the term comprehension that he uses and uh, he, start, he uses that in his logic. And it's, it's a very distinctive use of reason. He starts out by defining it as a use of reason uh, and it thinks in holistic terms, but it's always relative. It's always relative to a particular purpose. And we, in order to understand what's going on here, you have to understand what purpose is at play? And what is our particular uh, thing? But I'm, I'm going on too long and there must be other questions. Rudy, can, Rudy, can I, can I you, you would be aware that I speak both fluent Dewey and, and, do, and fluent Kantian. And so in three sentences, I can answer Fenil's uh, question from your answer in Dewey uh, for those who prefer that language. Uh, so Peniel, there, there are a number of Deweyans with us, but in, in, in Dewey and Peniel, what he's saying is Dewey, Dewey's an experience is immediacy. And as soon as reflection intervenes, an experience is over. The medial experience of Diltai is something that allows both reflection and awareness. Dewey doesn't have anything like this. Um, uh, and so the medial experience is going to be less than full-blown Kantian reflective judgment, but it's not going to be immersed Deweyan primary experience. Uh, and, so, and so the question, if there's a difference between Rudy and, and Dewey, 
it has to do with the presence of reflection in experience, in, in, uh, in uh, aesthetic experience. How present is it and what function does it fulfill? Uh, and so Dewey is pretty, I hate to say this, dualistic about this. The moment reflection sets in and experience is over. Rudy is saying that isn't how it works. That is what? That's, that that's isn't nice. how it works. That there's something in between. Yeah. yeah, that there's something in between. And it's not exactly a symbol, and it's a, and it's and it's not exactly an immediate experience. Uh, it is culturally it is culturally relevant, but it is not culturally limited um, in 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 the way that most people understand culture. However, if you go to Burstika's understanding of culture, there's no limitation involved. <laughs> so, uh, so, so anyway, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I just, that, that's very insightful. Oh, pretty... that's, that's yeah, I, I appreciate that uh, intervention. Okay. Uh, Professor Roshinska, to get to our next one. Yeah, thank you for that, Randy. That was good. I think that helped br bring it full circle nicely. Uh, but Professor Roshinska had a question. Uh, you have to be off mute. You're uh, muted. So uh, turn off the mute button. Oh, no. We'll uh, give her a second. It's uh, in the bottom left hand okay, corner. I did, I did already. I did already. It's okay. So, um, very short question. What kind of value has a decontextualization? Recontextualization? Recontextualization? Yeah. What kind of value? Is it aesthetic value or what kind of value? Well, it, 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 it can have all kinds of value. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the function of it is to open, you know, to open your perspective, to, op to reorient yourself to. Uh, so, and that can be aesthetic, can be ethical, can be at any level, uh, can be cognitive too, you know, but it's, but it's kind of, it doesn't have to be defined as a particular level. It's, it kind of works at different levels. Um, One sentence to, to Randy. But, Randy, reflection kills the experience. Kills? No. No, I mean, yes, I'm saying it doesn't. At least makes you make, yeah. Say it one more time. What, what are you asking? I'm not asking. I'm answering. Oh. Because because I think that the reflection kills the experience. Kills the experience. That's what Dewey says. So we have yeah. a triangulation here. Uh, Rudolf, uh, Professor McCreel says, no, we're trying to go yeah. to the intermediary space. We have Dewey on the side. You're sounding of like where reflection does kill the experience. So just to keep uh, track uh, of where our, our, yeah. our positions that's, are. Uh, that's the beauty of reflective judgment. Okay. It is not, uh, it's, it's an, a provisional, uh, exploratory uh, way of thinking that doesn't kill it. It just expands the experience. Uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's not that dualism. It's either thinking or experiencing. It's, uh, you could say that determinist, determinate judgments kill the experience because they fix it. But reflective judgment doesn't fix it's open ended. It, it's 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 in it's in 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 flux. It moves from one context to another. It's uh, it's it shifts your way of thinking. So it's not so reflective judgment is not a kind of determination that fixes things, and you know, so that it. I I, I see. I think in in. Uh, if you think in dualistic terms, I think in in uh, the in intermediary terms, and that's what I think is important about these these different contexts. You you shift from one to the other. You're moving back and forth, and and therefore you are you haven't. There's something always provisional about a reflective judgment. It's not. Um, you know, like Longinus says that a reflective judgment is a failed judgment. And I say, no, it's just a provisional judgment. 
It's not trying to once and for all fix uh, in, in discursive terms what is at hand. So it opens up. Okay, it maybe keeps in, it keeps in play uh, your thinking, and it's 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 so it maybe, doesn't. Maybe maybe we we different understand by the word experience. Yeah, well, I mean, it 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 does. Yeah, because it doesn't. But to say it kills the experience or whatever you said is wrong. It just it it it's it, wrong. Uh, it plays okay. with. <laughs> I will think about it. Maybe it is wrong, but if if you are talking about emotional experience, it is not wrong. But if you are talking about intellectual experience, of course it is wrong. So it depends what you understand by experience. I want to continue this debate, but I also want to make sure there are other questions. So maybe perhaps an interjection is especially if you have a related question, want to add something spicy into this interesting dialogue about well, experience the, nice, and reflection. the nice thing, Eli, is that we don't have any more papers, and so we can talk pretty much as long as we want to. Great. And so, so we're not we're not dealing with a. I mean, it's way past midnight up there in uh, up there in Poland. Eleven. You're we're safe. No, it's we're only not eleven. Past yeah. It's eleven. But uh, but in any Five case, we're not, dealing, we're not dealing with limits on purpose. So mm -hmm. if Rudy wants to respond to Zofia, I think he should. Uh, yeah, I mean, I take it when uh, you say an intellectual experience, uh, then I don't know what, uh, um, what, what is an intellectual, I thought you're talking about an ordinary experience, you know, where I, where I, it's ordinary react. experience. Yeah, I mean, that's what more like uh, what Randy was talking about, an experience, it's not, it's a uh, it's a kind of a common sense where you, you where you're just using ordinary language to describe uh, what's going on, but then there's also a scientific way of kind of to determine that, and that would kill the ordinary sense of experience. But I don't know what you mean yeah, by then... intellectual experience. I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah, but you know, we're you're... talking about art, which is not purely intellectual. It's felt as well as intellectual. So... But if you are talking about scientific experience, then we say experiment, right? Yeah, that is the product of experience. Yeah. And so so I mean, every, everything that's scientifically uh, determined and accepted would be a case of de de determinant judgment in my Kantian language. But I'm talking about those things that haven't been, like in Kant's time, the way organisms, you know, scientists, science was defined in terms of mechanistic terms and, and ordinary, and, but organisms don't, we can't understand what's going on in organism in mechanistic terms. That's why I used reflective judgments to talk about them as as a kind of uh, or imminent have a kind of imminent purpose of the, something like your in inner necessity they have an imminent purposes it's or he calls it the purposeness the purposiveness of no the lawfulness of the contingent it's uh, so you find a certain order but it's it's still there's something provisional about it. It doesn't, it satisfies our way of making sense of it, but it isn't scientifically confirmable. It's not determinate. So it's it's a kind of a still in flux. And that's what I mean by reflective experience, that it you can reflect on artistic, on ordinary experience uh, and without killing it because you're just, ex, you know, exploring. That's true, thank you. Uh, just as a side, I wonder if Bergson would be another example of someone who kind of falls in between, right? With reflective intuition as another, just uh, of our group. But let's open it up to other people. Are there other questions people want addressed? 
Uh, sure. Uh, Ralph, go ahead. Turn on your off your mute. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Ralph. We can't hear you. I'm glad you realized I was trying to talk. I think what Rudy was just saying is also applicable to emotional experience because there are two different ways to reflect on an emotion. You can reflect on it by talking at it, or you can reflect on it by listening to it. And I think when you reflect on it by listening to it, you don't kill it, you actually intensify it and get deeper into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope and, that you always change that, it. That's but you change that, it. Well, I think you change it by getting rid of some of the artificial trappings of it, and get to what it really feels like. You you focus on what it really feels like, and get away from what you would superficially assume the feeling is about. And so you're you're moving deeper into the feeling rather than making it into an object. Yeah, right, rather than fixing it. So listening, uh, and there's a passage in, in Kant that I use in my book where he talks about the importance of listening. And of course, Heidegger, of course, really uh, pays attention to that. Huh? The idea of listening uh, rather than seeing because uh, seeing tends to kind of fix, could you could understand that as trying to fix something, but listening is to is to be open. Uh, I see Katie Homan, another. So not only Randy is my student, but Katie was my student, and of course Lori Muller. You, I was on your committee, but I never met you before. I never saw. How beautiful you are. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It's very nice to finally see you and hear you in person. Good. So even though I couldn't speak very well, but I had help from Randy, so that was good. So, but you could understand most of what I said, I hope. Yeah, I oh. think all of it was quite, came through quite clear. Okay. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Others, I don't want to tire that voice out too much, but I think we probably have some more questions in this group. Yeah, I'm sure. I have a question. Um, it's just a very basic practical question mm -hmm. with how you ended your paper that today the challenge is to recontextualize things medially to nudge us to question what we have done to this world and help us to remake it. So I would just really like to hear some specific examples of how this medial recontextualization has revealed what we've done and how to remake it. Like what are specific things we've done that we aren't aware of until we use this kind of medial um, recontextualization? Yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, contemporary art is kind of uh, kind of a way of shocking us, you know, uh, uh, in order to kind of uh, make us see what we have done to this world, you know, which is pretty is pretty awful, uh, you know, with all the all the uh, pollution and all the concrete that you know we've poured everywhere and we've destroyed nature and i think a lot of art uh, today kind of makes us uh, makes us more aware of what we have done in that way uh, so uh, it's a lot of art has a kind of shock value today, kind of to startle us out of our complacency, I think. And uh, but maybe I'm reading too much into that. But you know, I think uh, we have done so much, you know, to our world. Uh, here I'm, I guess, 
I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, being an environmentalist, you know, believing in worried about climate change and, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, that um, there's so much we, we have uh, done to make the world uh, you know, to, to ruin nature and to, uh, and, and, and we just keep on going and doing it. But here I'm, I don't want to preach, but, uh, but uh, I think, uh, but if you go back to that Picasso portrait that I was thinking about, you know, where you see, you can see both the living aspect and the geometrical uh, re deconstruction of that. Uh, I think it's, it speaks to us in a way that uh, is meant to make us think and to reflect, you know. So, so it's not just not just a given experience, but an experience that that we. Uh, my bell was ringing, but I, <laughs> I'll just ignore it. Uh, my world is uh, is probably somebody asking me to sign a petition to do something about what's going on in Georgia these days with our, our new voting restrictions. <laughs> yeah. Other questions. Sure, other people have some, some thoughts about uh, contemporary art and the way that it kind of is meant to kind of uh, shock us in a way. I, mean, I, I think a contemporary art is not beautiful. Uh, it's not, oh, contemporary art is not beautiful in the way that Botticelli or Vermeer or even Rembrandt is, you know, it's more like uh, uh, a kind of, you know, starting with Goya, looking at the world as is something that has gone astray, but um, but I don't want to end up this talk with all this sad <laughs> sad talk. I I think uh, Professor Burstica has a question, and maybe I shift gears. No, you know the funny. That's not a bad a bad note to end on the rustings these days. But uh, uh, Shemit, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Eli. Uh, first of all, Professor Mahil, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I have, a, I, I think, a very general question. At least I believe it is a very general question. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, this power uh, of art to reconst re recontextualize uh, is something uh, uh, commonly recognized. Uh, do you think, uh, because th this would be very interesting for the purposes of the, the further development of, uh, of my train of thoughts, uh, do you think uh, we can ascribe the similar power to philosophy or uh, other intellectual uh, activities or even pra some practical forms of activity, uh, this power of reconciliation recontextualizing of uh, putting us uh, uh, out of our shoes uh, and, and changing our perspective on the reality. No, oh, yeah, I mean, that's why, I, as I said earlier, it's a part of a more hermeneutic project, which I think is, uh, so it applies at, on, at, uh, at the level of philosophy or ethics or, uh, you know, at many levels. So you're right about that. It's not, I just, but I, it, this was a kind of a way to do it, to show graphically what I talk about, but, but, but other disciplines like philosophy can do that as well. Yes. In fact, uh, I, I had a question about your sense of culture 
uh, sometimes when you were talking about culture as kind of a condition for as pre-scientific, I thought of it as the way Hegel and Dilthey talk about objective spirit. But what, what do you think about that? Is, is how how does it relate to what Dilthey and uh, Hegel talk? Well, Dilthey generalizes it, you know. Um, uh, as a uh, kind could, of, could you could you repeat the phrase? Uh, objective spirit. Object objective spirit. Uh, uh, geist, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I do. Uh, I uh, I disagree with uh, Hegelian uh, over uh, theological. Diltai, well, Diltai, kind Dilthey of. Diltai fits much better uh, into the, the the into my picture. Uh, however, it seems that he still operates from the kind of distinction. That's why I didn't refer to him because it seems that he's for me. There are a few moments uh, which are quite valuable in Dilthey, uh, but there are some other which uh, suggest that he didn't uh, he didn't uh, rethink uh, Kant very carefully, uh, and I mean he was on the side of those distinctions which were undermined by Kant. I mean subject object thought being and so on and so forth. Uh, so he he was like uh, trying to. Uh, and the best exemplification of that could be his opposition between uh, humanities and other sciences. So it seems that he uh, operates from within, uh, from within uh, the old Picantian framework of thinking about culture. Um, yeah, of course, I, 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 I have a very that's Kantian, not, I have a very good. Kantian interpretation. You know, before I. Uh, I wrote about Diltai. He was seen as a Hegelian, kind of like Collingwood. But his mm -hmm. project is a critique of historical reason. And mm -hmm. one of my main claims is that his, his understand, explanation, understanding, distinction, you know, the natural science explain, mm -hmm. the human science understand, yeah. can be overlaps with Kant's reflect, determinant reflective judgment distinction. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so that in my terms, reflective judgments are interpretive judgments. They, yeah. they try to understand, put things in context. Mm -hmm. Understanding is to put something in context. Mm -hmm. So that to understand an experience and to, and to kind of become clear oh, yeah. about the context is, is what is decisive. So reflective judgment is contextualizing and explanations are deterministic. Sure. So that that's, sure. and, 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 the, and the great idea that, the stuff that he stole and developed from Kant is the notion of imminent purposiveness. All his cultural systems are imminently purposive. So the Kant yeah. only applied that to organisms and Delphi extended it to cultural systems that mm -hmm. Instead of seeing history as objective spirit in the universalistic way that Hegel does, he says, no, we have to understand history as not as a grand narrative, but as an interplay of the different cultural systems that are at work there. And each mm -hmm. of them has an imminent purposiveness. So that, I mean, th that is my, my main, I think, contribution to Dilta. I understand that nobody had really said that before. And that's mm -hmm. the way he is Kantian. And he rejects a lot of things in Kant, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. especially well, the, the theoretical uh -huh. a priori. But my, uh -huh. I just published volume six of his, of his uh, selected works. And in there, there's a long essay, it's called The System of Ethics. And there he ends up saying that there is a practical a priori. So that he becomes even more Kantian there. He talks about a practical a priori. No theoretical a priori, but there is a practical one. Practical so a priori, uh, like, he, in the, like, like in the symbol formation. Say it again. Like practical a priori, like in the case of symbol, for example. 
Yeah. Like a practical determination or practical orientation, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, in this sense, I, uh, I would say I, uh, I, fully, I fully buy your uh, reinterpretation of Dirtai. And in this, in this light, I can, I can see, it, uh, see him as uh, being on my, on my side. So yeah, and so he redefines objective spirit. Uh, uh -huh, exactly. So this this reinterpretation and this reinterpretation of uh, uh, of the uh, strong distinction, uh, as it is commonly referred to, uh, I mean, Dilta is commonly described in this way as maintaining the strict division between uh, two realms, uh, two regions of reality. That uh, was unconvincing for me. But uh, when you present it uh, through the lens of Kant, it sounds as, uh, much more acceptable for me. Good. My point, my starting point was that my, my thinking is closer to Kant, especially from the from the third critique, than to uh, than to. Yeah, I call, I call him a third critique Kantian, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is the best kind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, um, thank you, Professor. Chemek and I have had a thousand conversations, Rudy, but. Conversation number one thousand and one. When yeah. I get there, when I get to Warsaw in October, is going to be your interpretation of Dilta. <laughs> so. And who is talking here? I am yeah. Randy. Oh, Randy, Randy. Okay. So, so oh, yeah. conversation yeah. number one thousand one is how Dilta is a Kantian in the best sense. <laughs> so. Yeah. Good. So, uh, Randy, uh, did I did I did I uh, get it uh, correctly? You expect me to present you my interpretation of Dirtai? No, your interpretation is going to be wrong, and so I'm just going to present Rudy's to you. I see, but the, this reinterpretation, I'm not sure, Randy, whether this conversation is necessary. I am already on the side of Professor Macri's interpretation of Dirtai, so I well, think I'm on the right side many, right now. There are many. Many intricacies in there that he can talk about. He's a smart oh, yeah. student. He can even oh, yeah. go beyond me. Oh yeah, I, I know that. I know the, the this personal aspect of your relationship. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. Maybe as a we'll see if there's others, but as a nice tie into all three essays. Uh, I, I don't know quite how to articulate it, but maybe my uh, the presenters can help me. Are we dealing with the, the same legacy of kind of third critique Kantian idealistic thought in each of the three pieces? Are we in the same school here? Are we with Deltai or Hegel or have we fallen off the map? Like speaking no, of hermeneutic context. There are no idealists in this conversation. This is hermeneutics. Sure, that's why I chose legacy. You notice there's careful word in there, Randy. You legacy, not hermeneutics. But are, are they all hermeneutics then? Is that the right term? Yeah, I mean, like I think that uh, Dilga has three worldviews that he distinguishes. Naturalism, subjective ide uh, idealism, freedom, and objective idealism. And I think hermeneutics is objective idealism without the idealism. But it's, it's, it's in the same spirit. It's trying to harmonize as much as possible in reflective ways. And uh, Professor Rashinska, do you think uh, Ostrazewski, do you think he was, do you think he kind of falls into this kind of hermeneutics? What do you think? Oh, excuse me, I, 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 I was just thinking about, about something different. Could, could, you, sure, could sure. you repeat your question? No, no, so no, my question would... is, we, we were talking about whether there's a, a similar legacy to all the thinkers taught about today. And uh, Professor McCreel just said, you know, the kind of hermeneutics in a sense he does is sort of like, uh, what is it? A building from Dutai is like, a, 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 what is it? Objective idealism without the objective part. It's kind without of like- Without the ideal, uh, without the speculative ideal part. Oh, it was it about the speculative idealism part. Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. My it's dyslexia a made it so It's a judgmental version of, uh, objective idealism, not a deterministic one, not like Hegel, you know. Okay. Yeah. So in that sense, do you think, where do you think Strazuski, where do you think he falls in this? Is he, do you see, is he considered a kind of hermeneuticist of this sort? Or do you think but, he's in his own territory? But it is very difficult for me because, because the, 
it is historical uh, interpretation. I am right. not Kantian. I was Kantian, but but I stopped to be Kantian. So and 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 Diltai, Diltai, of course, is I mean everybody loves Diltai, everybody loves Kant, and I don't know what we are talking about. Are we interpreting Kant? Or are we trying to apply what Kant says about contemporary life? Or are we talking to think about a uh, different kind of feelings with, uh, which are intersubjective and, and communicative, communicable? And, and, and then of course, the question is if they are, are why, why they are not? Why, why, why are we having so many conflicts? Why are we fighting with each other? Could you explain this to me? This is my, these are my questions. I, I was not, you know, I'm not prepared for today to talk about historical problems because it is serious and I'm, I'm not prepared for it. So I don't know, that's fine. But, but let's shift then, <laughs> G give me one to start with. Where do you want to start on that list? Give me a, a question of a few. Again? Uh, so you gave us a few lists of these contemporary problems then. I was thinking of commonalities between the paper. Are there, I'll put it to you a different way then. Do you see all three of the papers presented today as having any sort of continuity how we should address our problems in the present? Is there anything that struck you between all three papers? Yeah, but what kind of problems? What kind of That's a good question. The problem. So like, for example, I can open this up to other people when I was thinking about something like this recontextualization problem. For example, I noticed in both Pashemik's paper and uh, Professor McCreel's paper, right? There is something about the important reconstruct, what would you call it? Reconstructive efforts of culture to be able to revitalize and bring things into a present context that are needed and perhaps even in Strzewski, right, that art, if art's successful, is at this moment of dialectical tension, right, with the present situation. Like if it's not being able to overcome and make us more attentive to something in our broader situation, then it's activity or something else, if I was understanding you correctly. So like one example I'm seeing might be for contemporary problems is all three papers ask us to do some sort of reconstructive effort to attend to what's been missed in the present situation or it's become mundane, it's become commonplace and maybe ought not to be, like, you know, the environmental damage we're doing to the world. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but that's one that strikes me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, it is kind of intro introduction to, to, to further discussion because, you know, just to, to fight, to define the problems and then to concentrate on problem or problems. Don't you think? Yeah, maybe part of it is I'll, I'll give to other people, but like the papers are, I think these papers are more addressing how, in a way, how you go about attending to the problem, how you pick a problem, right? So I'd say, so what's the question of recontextualizing? Well, how do you, we should ought to be attending to things that we might have missed in the background that are critical to who and what we are. And we want to find these medial spaces where we can be attentive to that. So maybe the answer, I don't know, this is just me thinking out loud. I'd be curious for other thoughts. Is all three papers, if we use our Dewey in language again, are trying to help us learn how to attend to a problematic situation in the first place, as opposed to getting, uh, lost or too narrow in scope or too kind of predefined or isolated about how to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, if I may, uh, I would supplement what Eli said. When I was working on my uh, outline, which uh, was quite clear that this is nothing more than, than an outline uh, of something, uh, of some bigger project, uh, I was thinking that uh, the driving force for my reflection in a bit, uh, let's say, playful way at the beginning, I say that I simply wanted to respond to the question, what the hell is philosophy of culture? What is it about? Uh, and then I 
very quickly realize that something something trivial that this it consists of two two questions which are essentially related to each other what is culture what is philosophy of culture and then uh, i realized that i have a quite a quite a background uh, derived from uh, from my teachers uh, as i already said and as you already know russian state one of them and uh, So relying on my, or being based on my teachers, I, I realized that there is a kind of entanglement in those two questions, in the object and in the, in the, in the, the mode of uh, apprehending this object, which is commonly referred to as philosophy of culture. Uh, and then I realized that this is not a philosophy of culture, but simply philosophy. Uh, at least since the, let's say, the middle of, uh, or even the first half of the 20th century. But then in the course of, uh, course of working on that, I step by step realized that in answering the question, what is culture, I, mm, we are, there is a certain thing which can be either lost or one. There is something to be won or something to be lost. And I believe that our understanding of both philosophy and first of culture, uh, especially the understanding, if we arrive at the understanding of culture, which escapes all forms of reductionism, uh, we are not involved in a purely theoretical uh, cold blooded, so to speak, form of reflection. We are already engaged in culture and we are engaged, engaged in such a way as to avoid and resist any forms of fundamentalism, dogmatism, and so on and so forth. That's why it, it was so important for me uh, what was said by Professor Mackel, by Professor. Uh, uh, Roshinska referring to Professor Struzewski, because those are the powers of culture, which in my opinion are typical for or characteristic for all culture, all, all, all culture, all cultural activities, genuine cultural activities, to resist those tendencies. And we live in times where, as we all know, I guess, know perfectly, uh, we live in times when we are again facing this risk in a quite disturbing way. It is sufficient to closely observe what's going on in the US, what's going on in the Central Eastern Europe. We are facing uh, the rise of the tendencies which are very dangerous for culture because they can lead to the situation in which this vitality, this creative driving force of culture can be for time being, let's hope it will not be a case. And if it will be a case, it will be a short time. So for time being can be covert or I wouldn't say annihilated, but um, forgotten for a time being. Uh, and we see it even in the forms of response to the, uh, to the, um, to this rising uh, fundamentalistic tendencies. The responses with, of the defenders are too often based, in my opinion, on the aggressive attitudes. Oh, you are a fundamentalist. You have no right to be so. There is no, there is a kind of a lack of understanding that culture, culture is tense and consists of so many different, extensive and plural. That means it consists of so many different worldviews, so many different paradigms and so many different perspectives. So we are not going to um, denigrate those who are uh, not on our side, but to maintain our task as philosophers is to maintain this tensive element, to enter into a kind of creative dialogue. 
Yeah, to that, that's precisely the importance of contextualizing. Uh, exactly. And open exactly. up. And, and that's where I kind of sometimes I, I distinguish hermeneutic and recontextualization from the kind of dialectical binary kind of, you know, oppositional us them kind of way of thinking. So that I think an orientational mode of approach um, and recontextualizing uh, is perhaps more useful uh, to deal with these kind of restrictive, constructive um, things that you were talking about, what's going on in Poland and what's going on in Georgia. Uh, you know, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of an oppositional, binary, uh, destructive kind of uh, debate. And that, so that thinking about opening up the horizon uh, and, and, and thinking reflectively is, I think, an important counterforce to these terrible things that are happening today. If I could intervene just for a second, I would say that Chemek's paper seems to indicate that philosophers really must lead the way. Rudy's paper seems to indicate that anybody could lead the way. Um, <laughs> because the question is the access to the medial realm, to, to put it in Rudy's terms. And the access to the medial realm for Rudy has nothing to do directly with the capacity for philosophical reflection. Artists can do it too. The politicians could even do it in principle. I mean, so Rudy's conception would be that you don't need philosophical understanding in order to intervene um, in the progress of culture. And that would be in keeping with Diltai as well. But what you would expect is that there are people, even if they're not philosophers or philosophically trained or anything like that, there are people who seem to have some kind of connection to, and this would be my question for you, Rudy, there are people who seem to have some kind of weird connection to the progression of objective spirit, to use Diltai's Dil language. Um, and they aren't necessarily philosophers. And, the, and, and, and they don't even have to have a critical conception of culture, but there's a something that they have, this intuition or this insight or this reflective power purpose, right? There's a something that these leaders of culture have that sort of enables them to intervene in what you might call the conventional progression of spirit. And uh, and so without going into a full blown Hegelian, you know, like great man theory of history or something like that, there really is a role for the artist in Delta, but it's not it's not it's not restricted to the artist. There's a role for the artist that really has to do with becoming sort of, dare I say it, the symbol of overcoming whatever limitations are pressing in on us. Yeah. <clears throat> The media uh, is a kind of uh, more general way, but it is itself like, you know, I talked about Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven as part of a medial context in classical Vienna, but they weren't just anybody. They were, you know, they're, they were great in their own way, but they did, you know, incredible uh, things and so that it can be done at different levels, but it, it can be so a medial context can can involve conventions even in in more intellectual disciplines. You know, so it doesn't have to be at a lower level, but it it, it can be at at at, at different levels. Uh, but you, it's true. And you know, like films can probably have more influence than you know politicians and changing, you know, like what's happening now with uh, with Black Lives Matter. It's a, it's the fact that you can have a uh, an iPhone and take pictures of 
Joven doing his knee on the neck. I mean, that has been more of a difference, I think, than than any law. You know, people have seen how how terrible blacks are treated. Uh, we, you know, you read the statistics, but when you see that nine minutes, that that's incredible. So I mean, so that that reinforces your point you know, I think you know so I'm open to that but I wouldn't just leave I, I think that at, at a more refined hermeneutical level it's I'm hoping that things can change too right so it doesn't and that's you know that's where I, I people like ourselves can make a distinct and make a difference you know. Well, Basically, I, I agree with Przemek said. <laughs> what? No, no, I just wanted to say that I, I, I basically agree what Dr. What Przemek said, what Dr. Bursztyka said, and, and Rendell, I think that we think in a similar way, so. Well, well, but, if, but it is if, difficult. If, if I may add something to what, uh, what Randy said. Uh, well, basically, uh, you are right. I was concentrated on philosophy uh, for two reasons. Uh, one for the because of the time limitation. The other one, but that the main ta the main task was uh, to provide a theory of philosophy of culture. So that was that's why I was uh, interested. And there was also f a third reason for doing this. So. Uh, I would like to add two things. Uh, I, do, I, I do really believe that uh, philosophy as philosophy of culture uh, or philosophy of culture as philosophy has this special task to be the most, uh, this, this special and I would even say exclusive task, uh, exclusive in a sense of being main and fundamental task. Uh, of being an agent of cultural self-reference in a sense of culture self-critique and self uh, in the most uh, and self-questioning in a most uh, let's say um, systematic uh, the most uh, developed and so and so and so forth form. Uh, but as I uh, refer to Professor Rosinska, and I, I have no place to develop it. I do really believe that uh, philosophy operates always already on the level of social practice before any con uh, contextualization, uh, I mean, uh, conceptualization, theorization, and so on and so forth. So I do believe, and I even quote uh, Heidegger in uh, one of those writings when I uh, refer to here, that whenever man exists, philosophy of, of a kind always emerges. Uh, so in this sense, I, I think that philosophy operates uh, in, uh, can operate in any, any, each or each genuine cultural activity, being it practical or theoretical. Uh, artistic activity, uh, I believe, has more freedom than uh, philosophical activity and can also play some other roles than the uh, recontextualization or being involved in the change of the world uh, we live in. Uh, but I consider philosophy of culture, genuine philosophy of culture, as being practical in a sense of having this fundamental task as its main task. So that, that's for, for the sake of uh, short supplement to, to what you say, Jenny. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put aesthetic, uh, you know, recontextualization over practical, uh, but I think they can work together, uh, you know, so it's not, not an either or, uh, but obviously practical philosophy is more important than aesthetic. But, but I think aesthetic uh, and hermeneutic thinking can uh, provide a, a, a more comprehensive framework for what philosophers do. So, so I don't think we're all that different. 
you know. Yeah, I, 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 I do agree. Uh, if I may, one more, more thing to, to what Professor Roshinska said, because you, at the end uh, you said that uh, it is difficult, that you agree with me, and, uh, but this is difficult. Uh, well, again, I, I haven't, uh, I hadn't enough time to, to develop this point. Of course, it is difficult to maintain this extensive, extensive character of culture is to be open to the otherness, but this openness to the otherness does not always is something pleasant and uh, joyful or playful. Sometimes it's broad, it leads to the broadening of our understanding of uh, reality and it's, it's purely valuable experience. Uh, but sometimes and very often it leads to the deadly conflicts when the two different conceptual and especially axiological uh, frameworks meet, meet uh, the risk of a deadly conflict is always a play. So now there is a certain task for those who can be considered philosophers, and I do not mean only academic philosophers. I mean all those people who are capable to stand with some, uh, to observe phenomena with some distance and to give them some, uh, and to, pro to create a, some bigger picture of uh, this or that cultural phenomenon or a series of phenomena. So to conceptualize them in some, in this or that way. <coughs> this is the special task, task. This is a kind of uh, axiological obligation, which is ascribed in the manner, which is our obligation as philosophers of culture. To see that, to give justice to conceptual or um, in case of philosophy, mainly conceptual, to give justice to those all those situations, all these uh, phenomena. Uh, but there is no promise that there would be no deadly conflicts. But so there is always a possibility, always a risk. But there are certain things that are cannot be con fully conceptualized, where we have to go with analogical thinking, and that's what. I'm, I was trying to expand on. I mean, and that's not to downgrade. You know, if everything could be conceptualized, that yes. would be wonderful. And then we could have yes, perfect I'm... agreement. But that's a precisely the problem. Everything can't be properly conceptualized, and therefore we have to make room for ideas and reflective judgment, where we can kind of maybe just come to a certain kind of compromise, but not necessarily total reconciliation, you know, uh, that, that's precisely my point. That's where, that's where I'm a, a hermeneuticist rather than an idealist. If I were an idealist, I would think there is a, some Hegelian telos where everything mm -hmm. is reconciled. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever possible. And that's why uh, the arts are all so important. Mm -hmm. They can mm -hmm. go beyond and expand our horizon where concepts fail us. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But that's not to, I'm not an irrationalist. You know, I, I believe, you know, I, I want everything to be conceptualized, but it just isn't possible. Yeah, 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 I, I, I agree. I agree with you. And that's why, that's why I put that emphasis on the aesthetic. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah, where uh, sometimes you know, for Diltai, objective spirit or culture, in your sense, is the, the area of commonalities. And science tries to, to go from there to universalities. But there's a limit to how far we can reach universal agreement. And, you know, through concept. But, um, but I think we're, we're uh, getting a little tired here. Yeah, I was going to say we're hitting the midnight oil, literally, in the case of Poland. So maybe this is a, I, I welcome more if people have it, but I also want to be mindful of the hour and make sure we're rested for those of us who are doing tomorrow. So maybe it's a good time to wrap up now. Mm -hmm.